Thank you, Jamie. Amen. That was wonderful, man. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. It is, uh, it is so good to be back here with you uh, at Liberty. It's been a while. Uh, for me, it's been a while since I've preached. Uh, these pastor guys have been plugging through COVID, and uh, I'm, an, I'm an evangelist, so I haven't preached in months. And uh, this is my first time back preaching since mid-March. So uh, there was a miracle of turning the water into wine, raising Lazarus from the dead, uh, healing blind eyes. It's going to be a miracle uh, if you get out of here before midnight. And uh, now I, I'll try to be as efficient as I can. It's just I've been pent up a little bit. And, uh, and so uh, I'm thrilled. I, this COVID thing, you know, I'm, I'm not 50 yet, but I can see it from here. And, uh, and, and the closer I've gotten to that age, I, I've been like about life. I'm like, slow down, slow down, right? And uh, we hit COVID, and I'm like, speed up, speed up. How many of y'all ready just for 2020 to be over, over, over? I mean, good gracious alive. I saw somebody put on Facebook the other day that said, maybe we ought to pull uh, 2020 out the socket and blow on it a couple of times and stick it back in there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It ain't working right, is it? Uh, but I tell you what, if we ever needed Jesus, it's in 2020. I promise you that. Uh, Jamie and I have a little bit of a history. Um, I was a youth minister uh, slash children's minister for 10 months at a church called Northside Baptist in Elberton, Georgia. Y'all know that church. And, uh, and when I left and I was about to go into seminary and some other things, I think it was around 91, uh, they said, well, we need a replacement. And I can't remember how it all came together, but Jamie Calloway came in right behind me at Northside Baptist. And you were there for how long? Five, five years, a good long time and uh carried on that so we, we've been friends ever since then and and i preach for him and we're, we talk on the phone and text each other and he's just a blessing i know he hit a home run the other night and uh and he did amen he's a good preacher and uh, you've had some great preachers in here and uh mike stone's one of the best I, I just appreciate brother mike and what he's done not just for you know georgia but for the southern baptist convention a man of god and, and a fine preacher and one of my favorites to hear and, uh, and this Bible conference, uh, I mean, I, f I feel like a mule at the Kentucky Derby. I don't know how I got here, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I promise you that. Uh, but I'm a mid-good company. These, these guys have done a great job. And so it's my honor to be back with you, and I just believe we're going to have a good time tonight. Can I get an amen? amen? Now, I want you to look at the screen with me tonight because I'm going to do something a little bit different. It's a little bit out of character uh, for me. Typically, I come in, and I, I, I'm not typically very PowerPoint heavy at all. And uh, tonight I'm going to be, so I, I'm going to ask you to look at the screen. Matter of fact, uh, I, I'm typically a very ex expository preacher, just like the messages that you've heard this week, opening the Word of God and kind of pouring through the text, and, and I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight. Uh, we, we had this class in seminary where rather than looking at just one passage and drilling deep, we would look at all the passages through the Bible on a topic and form some theological conclusions based on all that we read in Scripture in different places in Scripture. It was called systematic theology. And so we're going to do a little systematic theology tonight around one main uh, idea that I believe might be one of the most relevant messages I could bring. And I promise you this, I'm preaching to me tonight as much as I'm preaching to you and I need this, and we need this. I believe the church needs this. I heard about a guy one time that cut his hand, and uh, so it was bleeding pretty bad. He wrapped it in a towel. His wife looked at him and said, you really ought to go get that looked at down at the emergency room. And so he said, you really think so? I guess I will. Might need stitches. So he went down to the emergency room, and he, uh, he, he went up to the receptionist there, and she signed him in, and she said, listen, behind me there's a long hallway. What I want you to do is walk down this hallway and at the end you're going to see two doors just walk through the door that applies to you the most and so he went around her desk and started down that hall he came to the end of that hall and he came to two doors one said male the other said female well he's a man so he walked through that door is the easy choice for him hard for some today but he went through that door and found himself on another long hallway and uh, he walked down to the end of that hallway, came to two doors. One door said external, the other door said internal. Well, he looks at his hand, he figures external. So he walked through that door, said external. Well, it put him on another hallway, so he started walking down that hallway. Got to the end of that hallway, and one door said above the waist, the other door said below the waist. Well, he looked at his hand, he thought above the waist. So he walked through the door that said above the waist. 
Well, he, he walked, he, he found himself on another hall, and so he started walking down that hallway. He got to the end of that hallway. One door said major, the other door said minor. Well, he figured a cut on the hand's relatively minor, so he walked through the door that said minor. Well, he found himself back outside in the parking lot. <laughs> so <laughs> he got in his car and drove home, pulled up at his house. His wife came out and said, well, were there any help to you down at the hospital? He said, no, but boy, are they organized. <laughs> now, I believe a lot of people have the same experiences in our churches today. They come in bleeding, they come in confused, they come in wounded, they come in broken, and when they walk out the exit door, they're not much better than they were when they came in, but boy, we sure were organized while they were there. I don't know about you, but I believe that the church of the living God is only as effective in the culture to the degree that we cooperate with God. To the degree that we do not cooperate with God, we are of no use in the culture. There's one key area of cooperation with God. But I believe, quite frankly, the church is failing at, but if we recognize the symptoms, see the need, and embrace the cure, I believe it could radically transform not only the church, not only your own life, but even potentially our very nation. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the screen, all the scripture. I'm not going to open my Bible. Don't, don't leave here saying Scott never even opened his Bible. All the scripture's on the screen. Y'all with me? So we're going to look at the scriptures, but it's going to be on the screen. So everybody say on the screen. All right, so be looking at the screen. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a verse up, and I'm going to answer a question about this. What is Jesus doing right now? Have you ever thought about that? What is Jesus doing right now? What is Jesus doing this very moment? There's a verse in the Bible that tells us exactly what Jesus is doing right now, and I'm going to put it on the screen. And when I put it on the screen, I want you to read it out loud with me. Are you ready? This is what Jesus is doing right now. Read it out loud. Christ Jesus. So that's what Jesus is doing right now, interceding for us. Now, what I want to do is I want to put up some synonyms for the word interceding. And the first word in it is mediation, not meditation. And we're going to read these synonyms out loud. So I want you to read the synonyms out loud for intercession. Read them right now. Intercession. So that's what Jesus is doing right now. Now, now, what does the Bible say that the devil is doing right now? He's active, he's, 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 he's working, he's doing something right now. There's a verse in Revelation that tells us that one day the devil is going to be cast down. And I'm looking forward to that day, can I get a witness? But I, 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 I need you to understand, he ain't cast down yet, can I get an amen? He's very at work. And the question is, what is he doing right now? Now, in this verse of Revelation, it tells us what he's doing up until the time that he's cast down. And in this verse, it tells us that he's going to be cast down. It, he's doing that thing until he gets cast down. Are you all tracking? And so I want you to read that verse out loud with me on the screen. Read it out loud for the accuser. Now, read the synonyms for accusation. Let's read it again. To accuse is to condemn, to denunciate, complain, blame, to reproach. That's what the devil's doing. Now here's another question. What is God looking for? Our key verse tonight is in Ezekiel 22, 30. And this is what God, this verse tells us what God is looking for. Let's read it out loud together. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy the land. Listen, God doesn't want to destroy the land. God says, I don't want to 
have to destroy the land. So in order to avoid destroying the land, I'm looking for someone who will stand before me in the gap. Now, years ago, we used to have Bible conferences, our ministry, and we had them all over the country, and we had some of the best preachers. We had Paul Sika in and Herb Hodges and a lot of great guys like that. One man we had is, was just, just, just one of the greatest men of God I've ever met named Peter Lord. And he, he brought this observation about gap, a definition of gap, and I owe him this insight, and I want to give him credit where credit is due, but it, it, it's a key insight to understanding this passage, I believe, and it's a definition I want to give you tonight. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put it on the screen Uh, the definition of gap and I want us to read it three times how many times three times out loud what is a gap God said I'm looking for somebody to stand in the gap what is a gap so I'm going to ask you three times what is a gap and you give me the definition so what is a gap what is a gap what is a gap There are gaps everywhere. Uh, the, the Congress has gaps. Uh, President Trump has gaps. The school board has gaps. Local governors have gaps. Your spouse has gaps. Your kids' show flat have gaps. Your pastors have gaps. Your deacons have gaps. Elders have gaps. There are gaps all over the place. There's a whole lot of space out there that exists between what is and what ought to be. Now, when you and I spot gaps, if we intercede, we're cooperating with Jesus. But if we accuse, we're cooperating with the devil. I scroll through social media or across the daily headlines, and I see that the Supreme Court has made yet another decision, and I see gaps all in it. Do I accuse and say, man, those oligarchs are running this country into the ground what's wrong with those heathens or do i say you know what the word of god tells me to pray for those in authority over me lord i know that they have the weight of the world on their shoulders i can't imagine all that goes into making a decision i'm not i don't necessarily agree with the decision that i see but lord jesus i pray that they would make decisions in righteousness do i pray for them do i intercede or do i accuse when i leave church on sunday and i i've spotted a gap in my pastor's theology according to me Do I do like the average Baptist does and go home and have roast pasta for lunch? Do I accuse? Or do I say, Lord, wherever the gap is in him or me, if we're not agreeing on what the truth actually is, Lord, I pray you'd open my eyes or his so we can come to the knowledge of the truth which pleases your heart. Do I accuse or do I intercede? If we accuse, we cooperate with the devil. If we intercede, we cooperate with Jesus. And let's just admit it right now. Social media in 2020 has merely magnified who we are already. And the truth be known, if what I'm saying is correct, then it seems more to the world like the church of the living God is more cooperative with the devil than they are cooperative with God. Because we are a boldly accusing people today. I want to talk about gaps for a minute. What is the hardest gap to handle? Let's talk about gap. Now, the hardest gap to handle is the space that exists between our expectations of a person's behavior and their actual behavior. Isn't that true? I mean, the hardest gap for us to deal with is when somebody in our world, especially if they live under the same roof as us, for us to deal with the space between our expectations of what they ought to be doing and what they're actually doing. Now, here's what I've noticed about gaps. When we see gaps in others, Four things. Number one, first of all, they're very easy to see. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. We are good at spotting gaps, ain't we? Man, listen, I don't know what you're good at, but I'm good at spotting gaps. And I can just tell you, if I know something about you, you're probably good at spotting gaps too, right? Some of you are good at cooking and cleaning and and, and fishing and spotting gaps. Some of you are good at at fixing cars and mowing the yard and spotting gaps. Some of you are good at science and math and spotting gaps. Let me tell you something. Whatever you're good at, I promise you, one of the top three is spotting gaps. It is very easy to see gaps in other people, is it not? As a matter of fact, it's not only very easy to see, it's very easy to judge. As a matter of fact, when we see a gap in somebody else, I'll be the first to admit it. My first thought is a snarky thought. My first thought is a negative thought. My first thought is a judgmental thought. It is very easy to judge. Listen, by the way, that's why we have road rage. 
because there are only so many perfect drivers in the world and they're all in this room right now. <laughs> Everybody out there is an idiot, am I right? Son, we get so mad behind the wheel of a car as if we never make a mistake ourselves. Man, I'm telling you, gaps are easy to judge, but let me tell you number three, they're very easy to misjudge. Because when I judge a gap in somebody, I have gaps in my own judgment when I exercise the judgment on their gap. And they're impossible to fill. Can I just help some of us in the room? Hear me. You can't fill the gap in somebody else's life. Hear me now. I'm trying to save you some headaches. You can't do it. As a matter of fact, you can't even fill your own gaps. <laughs> you ever tried to get better? How'd that go? You got it one day, said, I'm going to be more patient. So you'd have cussed everybody out by the end of the day. I, I, we, can't, we can't even fill our own gaps. As a matter of fact, the more you try to fill the gap in somebody else's life, the more you will alienate them in the process. Now, God has no gaps. God has no gaps. As a matter of fact, we celebrate that fact. When we come to church and we sing, holy, 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 here's what we're saying. We're saying, God, there ain't no gaps in you. Amen. Listen, in God, everything is just right. There is no space that exists in him between what is and what ought to be. God has no gaps. Now, the problem is, Sin has made me full of gaps that hinder me from relating to God and relating to you the way I ought to relate to you. Well, I mean, we got sin, and sin has caused that gap. And so it, there's friction, and there's conflict, and there's judgment. Now, here's the question, though. What did God do when he saw the gap between our actual performance and his expectations of our performance. Now, now listen, it's one thing for me, a guy with gaps, to judge you, a guy with gaps, right? But when God, who has no gaps, judges me, a guy with gaps, he is perfectly just in his judgment. Are y'all with me? But what did God do when he saw the gap? Between our performance, our actual performance, and his expectations of our performance, here's what he did. He sent a gap filler named Jesus. By the way, that's what sets religion apart from Christianity. See, religion is an attempt to fill the gaps, usually with words and works. So man creates good works and rituals and liturgies and creeds and confessions trying to get religion to fill the gap. Here's what religion is. Religion is a man saying there's a gap between me and the supreme being, so I'm a, I'm a, I am going to fill that gap. However, Christianity is not man trying to fill his gap between him and God. Christianity is accepting the gap filler that God has provided in Jesus. There's a difference. So here's what you need to understand. When I receive, gap, when I receive Jesus, the gap filler, then the gap between me and God is totally 100% filled. There's no brokenness in the relationship anymore. And in Christ, I'm in perfect, right standing with Him. With nothing lacking. Do you, do you understand that the reason God can accept you in a relationship with Him is because in Jesus, to God, you are just as righteous as Jesus. Now, 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 I just lost some of you. You got real uncomfortable with that statement. Scott, you're saying I'm just as righteous as Jesus. You are just as righteous as Jesus, according to the Word of God. You say, you can't say that if you knew what I did this week. You're looking at the wrong thing. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus died on the cross for you and me, how much of my sin was deposited into his account for the wrath of God to pour out on him for payment? 100%. I'm telling you, in the same way he put all my sin, past, present, and future on Jesus, he put all his righteousness into my account, and I stand as righteous as Christ with him. Amen. 
You say, but Scott, why am I messing up? And why do I feel so far from God? Here's the difference. <clears throat> now, now track with me and I'll answer that question. To have the gap completely filled means, between me and God means, our relationship is perfect, lacking nothing. You'll never be closer to God if you're saved. If you're saved, you'll never be closer to God than you are right now. There's nothing else God can do to make you closer to himself in relationship than you are right now. I heard one man say, if God did anything to make us closer to himself, he would have to make us a fourth member of the Trinity. You say, but I don't feel close to God. Here's the difference. Fellowship is making full use of the relationship. See, see, see listen, I, I, I'll be married in next March. I'll be, I have been married 25 years, quarter of a century. And, and, and listen, we've had a great marriage. I told somebody the other day, uh, I, I, you know, like one man said, I've been happily married for 18 years. We're about to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Fits and starts. And now, now listen, here, here's the deal. When we celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary, just tell it where I want it to go and it takes takes me there with the GPS it's amazing it's amazing but at the end of the day you still call that thing a but if you don't ever talk to anybody fellowship is making full use so so, so what's the proof that the gap is closed to you between you and God what what, what proof can you give someone even from this last week that the proof as a proof that the gap between you and God is closed if the Bible says that it is. Now, what if you looked at me and said, Scott, how do you know that your wife loves you? And I said, listen, here's how I know that my wife loves me. In my home in Sugar Hill, Georgia, there is a closet. And in that closet, there is a shoebox. And in that shoebox, there is a letter. And in that letter, there are some words that says, I love you, Scarlet, 1996. Proof from 25 years ago, that woman loves me. You would not be impressed. You say, that's the best you got? No, if you say, Scott, 
prove to me that your wife loves you, you want to hear stuff like this. I got a text right here that she just sent that says, I love you. I walked up to her at the table before I left the house to come to Liberty Baptist Church, kissed her on the cheek, and she looked at me and said, I love you. Listen, I'm telling you, I love the fact that we have the Bible. There would be nothing we could know about God apart from it. It tells us all that we know about salvation and everything we need to know about God. I'm telling you, thank God for the Bible. I'm not making light of that, but there's something even better than Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's Jesus loves me. This I know, because he told me so himself this morning. Relationship, fellowship is the proof. Now, there, there, there are three possible responses to the gap we see. Now, now see, so the problem, let me just establish it. The problem is that isn't vertically, the problem is horizontally. God settled the vertical relationship. And we can have fellowship with God. You, you, you need to know and understand that. But the, so the problem isn't vertical, the problem is horizontal. It's the gaps that we deal with in each other. It's how we relate and how we get along and how we do it online when we see gaps in other people. Now, I know some of you are like, no, Scott, we don't even have gaps in our family. <laughs> I mean, the only reason we even come to church is to show people what a gapless family looks like. <laughs> oh, you lying in church. Because <laughs> I know what happens Sunday morning. Same thing that happens after every Saturday night. <laughs> You say, what do you mean? Oh, you got up too late Sunday morning to go to church because you stayed up too late on Saturday night. You were fighting over the ironing board, fighting over the shower. Pop-tarts were flying through the air. You barely get into the car with your makeup and clothes on. You remember, we got kids. <laughs> you go wake them up. That's a whole new war. Man, next thing you know, finally you're getting in the car. You're late on the way to church, and honey's mad at hubby. Why? Because she can't put her makeup on. Why she can't put her makeup on? Because he keeps running off the side of the road. Why does he run off the side of the road? Because he's driving with only one hand while he's swatting the kids who are killing each other in the back seat. When he finally rolls up into the yard of the park or the parking lot of the church, all your family gets out. The pastor walks by, says, hello, good morning. How y'all doing? Y'all smile and lie and say, great, praise the Lord. You about gapped each other to death all the way to church. We got gaps. And when we see gaps, we all got them. And everybody that lives in our house has them. There are only three possible responses. Number one, you can accuse. Number two, you can intercede. Or number three, you can ignore. Now, let me just point out that ignoring is easy if it's the waitress that you're only going to see for 45 minutes at your table. Ignoring is okay for the clerk at Walmart that's checking you out and she's having a bad day when she's ringing you up. I mean, ignoring is something we can do sometimes. But I have found that most of the people we go to school with, most of the people we work with, most of the people that we are kin to, especially if we're in close proximity, we do not have choice of number three most of the time. So either we are going to accuse or we're going to intercede. And the model for how we ought to respond is Jesus. Now, how did Jesus handle gaps in others? Number one, he washed Judas' feet. Let me ask you a question. Did he know what Judas was going to do? He sensed weakness in Peter's faith, and he said, Satan's after you, buddy, and let me tell you something. I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to kick you out of the group. That's not what he said. I've prayed, for, I've interceded for you that your faith may not fail. When Thomas had doubts, did he say, what's the matter with you? Where have you been, Thomas, for three years? I mean, do you need the miracle catalog? Do we got to go through it line by line, all the stuff that you saw, and all of a sudden you think that I can't do what I've been promising I was going to do all these years? You're out of the club. Is that what he said to Thomas? No, he said, no, you want, you want to touch the holes in my hands? You can do that. The hole in my side? Come on, Thomas. He, re, he patiently responded to Thomas's doubts and delivered appropriate evidence. That's how Jesus handled the gaps in others. By the way, this is a partial list. You say, but wait a minute, Scott. Is, is there ever a legitimate place for an accusation? I mean, come on, man. What if, what if somebody who's a pastor is taking money out of the church coffers or sleeping with a secretary? I mean, what if somebody who says they're a believer really gorges you really bad with their gap and it's, it's, it's ruining or it's damping the relationship as a pattern? I mean, isn't there ever a time where you have to bring an accusation? You just can't look over it. You just can't, you just can't ignore it. You just can't just forgive just like that. I mean, you got to deal with it. The answer is yes. But there are specific guidelines because it's reserved for certain situations and expected to be rare. 
In other words, God expected so much love out of his people for one another and forgiving each other of our gaps that he set up guidelines to handle it specifically. So if somebody offends you, hurts you, and the relationship is wounded, Matthew 18 is there for you. If there's an elder who's doing something sinful in the church and he's an overseer in the local body, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 19 through 21 tells you how to biblically bring your accusation. But mark this down. Number two, it's never, it's never, listen, never with gloating, gladness, or get him. If those are your responses in handling the accusation, you can do a right thing the wrong way and it becomes the wrong thing. Y'all with me? So if all of a sudden somebody's uh, in your church or somebody's in the body and you've got to bring an accusation and you even do it according to 1 Timothy 5, if you come in with a gloating at it, ha, 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 man, I knew something was going on. Or you're saying, it's about time he got caught. I knew it. Or, or he's, that's what's coming to him. Or get him. I know there's more. Keep digging. I'm going to tell you something. You're doing an unbiblical, you're, doing a, you're trying to do a biblical thing in an unbiblical way. Because what is the goal? The goal is always the glory of God and restoration. So check your heart when you have to bring an accusation. Now, what about when a gap isn't a gap? What are you saying, preacher? What I'm saying is, sometimes it may seem like there's a gap, and it's not really a gap at all. Because some people just act differently than you. They approach relationships differently than you. They approach ministry differently than you. For instance, maturity. Listen, can, can we just be honest? We're not all at the same place on our timeline with Jesus. What do you mean, Scott? It is wrong to expect somebody who's been saved for 18 months to act like somebody who's been walking with Jesus for 18 years. Listen, Jesus accepted you where you are. You need to accept them where they are. And then mentor them toward the Lord. But it may just be maturity. It may be varying backgrounds. We all come from varying, varying backgrounds. And so, and so, so we, we realize. See, some of y'all didn't even believe that. Y'all thought y'all was all the same till you got married. And you went to the first family reunion. <laughs> and you, you left your wife's family reunion. You got in the car. And you said, these people are crazy. And she thought they were the normal family. These people are crazy. Your family's crazy. I cannot wait till we go to my family's reunion next, next week for Christmas, and you're going to see how normal people act. <laughs> and she got in the car after yours and said, your people are nuts. Your people are crazy. Uh, can I just let us all do We're all crazy. All y'all's family's crazy. Everybody's crazy. Listen, we all bring varying backgrounds to relationships. We bring varying backgrounds to ministry. Sometimes it's not wrong. It's just different. Different giftings from God. We're, we're all gifted differently. For instance, my wife and I counsel differently. I subscribe to the Bob Newhart School of Counseling. Stop it. That would be $100, right? My wife will say, I'm going for coffee with Shelly, and it turns into dinner with Shelly, right? Counseling. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy about my wife, my, 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 my wife, Scarlett, she'll come in. And she'll say, hey, honey, I got a question for you. You got time for a question? I'm like, yeah, question. She said, well, here's the question. So I was over at Shelly's house the other day, and the reason I was at Shelly's house is because we'd just gone to the mall. And the reason we'd just gone to the mall is because we were trying to find that dress we couldn't find last time. Anyway, we ended up at her house. Actually, it's not her house. It's her mama's house, but she's living there while they're raising her baby. Anyway, you remember her husband left her. It's not the same Shelly as the other Shelly. It's this Shelly. Anyway, I was talking about this Shelly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it just goes... <laughs> One hour later, I'm, I'm going, was, was there a question somewhere? She can't just say, here's the question, right? But I'm going to tell you something. People would much rather be counseled by her than me, right? Because she, she doesn't miss a detail. Here's every sentence. Got feedback on all of it. Man, I'm telling you, listen. So, so what I used to see is a gap. I realize it's not a gap. It's a gift. Thank God not everybody is gifted like I am, and thank God not everybody's gifted like she is, but thank God somebody's gifted like she is, and thank God somebody's gifted like I am and you are. We're all different members of the body, and the hand doesn't do what the foot does, and the foot doesn't do what the knee does, and the knee doesn't do what the ear does, and the ear says, why don't you do it like an ear does? Listen, because it ain't a ear. The fact of the matter is we all have different gifts. It's not a gap. And thank God for it. Damages from the past. 
So you decide that you're going to go to the pound and get a rescue dog because all those dogs are unloved and they're outcasts and they've been beaten and abused and they need a good home who will love them and you love animals. And so you go down to the Humane Society and you go get you a pretty little dog that's a mutt that's just been cast out and had terrible owners all his life and you can't wait to show him this perfect dog bed you've got and the amazing do dog food that you've bought and the air conditioning and the July that he's going to enjoy in your house and you bring that dog home and you get him all there and you feed him and he's sitting in his bed and you go over there and you go out to pet him and as soon as you reach your hand out he jumps up yells and leaves the room <coughs> what's wrong with that dog next time you go to pet that dog <coughs> and he leaves and runs out every time you go to pet him he runs and leaves and you think what's wrong with that stupid dog don't he know that I rescued him I saved him I bought him I brought him out of the pit man I brought him into my house don't he see that bed he's sleeping in don't he taste that dog food he's eating don't he know that I love him look at this air conditioning this great house I'm showing him more love than he's ever had no all he knows is every time in his life the only frame of reference that he had when a hand went up is it came down hard between his nose it ain't you he's got to deal with where he's been to date and the fact of the matter is sometimes friend listen I know you're trying to love them but it ain't you it's where they've been it's what's happened to them already understand that sometimes your patient love can be the greatest thing God uses to get them to the healing that they need anyway it's not that it's a gap it's just where they've been understand we all come from different backgrounds and quite frankly if we knew what all of us what many of us in this room have gone through we'd never judge another person So how do you handle gaps? How, how do you handle gaps when you see them in your pastors and you see them in your deacon board and you see them in your school teachers and you see them in your president and you, and you see them in your wife and your kids and your uncles and cousins and your neighbors? What do you do when you see those gaps? How do you handle those gaps? Let me give you some advice. Number one, first of all, plan to forgive the hurts caused by their gaps. In other words, expect, listen, they're going to have gaps and their gaps are going to gorge you sometime. Just plan on it. Get ready. And plan in advance to be forgiving when you see the gaps. Number two, don't try to fix them. Only God can fix them. <laughs> Take it from the dad of a 21-year-old female. You can't fix their gaps. Listen, I read all the books. I was a book parent, man. I read all them books. None of them prepared me for what was coming. They lied to me, some of them books. I didn't know that 12, turning 12 was so hard because God was trying to get you ready for 13. And the only reason you survived 13 is because you could, so you could be strong enough to tackle 14. And then 14 just made way to 15. 15 was like walking through hell sideways. 16 was on the way. God help. now she's got a license. And then 17, and oh, Jesus, at 18 years old, you hear it every single day. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I'm an adult, Dad. I'm an adult. 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 I'm an adult now. I'm an adult, Dad. I'm an adult. I said, then make your bed. Pay some bills. And you that have had one of those kinds of people in your house, those 18-year-old people, you know what it's like? Because when they turn 18, they're going to they're gonna tell you about their friends, or they're going to tell you about their opinions, and they're going to tell you about their, your, their ideas on theology, and they're going to tell you what they believe and don't believe, and how it's different than you. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to see gaps. You're going to see gaps in their opinions and gaps in their friends and gaps in their theology. One day, she'll put a dress on that has too many gaps. I am confessing to you that I find it almost impossible to keep my hands off of trying to fix her gaps. But God keeps reminding me. And if we believe the gospel by a very belief in the gospel, it is a confession that God himself can do more in a heart in a second than we can do in decades in that same heart. Don't try to fix the gaps. You can't do it. Save yourself some migraines. Let go and let God. He can do more than you can. And listen, I've found in my life that the more I back off and let him work, the more work he does that I wanted to do anyway and couldn't have done if I'd wanted to even more. Number three, give thanks to God. Concentrate on the good that's in them. 
Let's face it, we tend to concentrate on what's not there that ought to be. And so the admonition is concentrate on what they have. Listen, I don't care who it is, there's something you can praise God for in them. And if they're saved and born again, they have not reached their potential any more than you have or any less than you have. And quite frankly, they have the same DNA potential in them to become more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit in the Word that you have. So focus on the potential that they have in them and give thanks to God. Recognize the high probability of projecting. You say, Scott, what do you mean? Psychologists tell us that if we see a problem in everybody else, it's probably that we got the same problem. If I look at you and I see a gap, and then I look at you and I see a gap, and I say, oh, there's that gap again. Oh, there's that gap again. He's got that gap too. She's got that. He's got that gap. You got that gap. Man, that gap's all over these people. Guess what? Probably I got that gap myself. So sometimes it's more about my judgment on someone else is more about me than them. And then stay filled with grace. You can't fix them, but you can fill them with grace. See, see you, you, listen, folks, grace changes everything. Grace makes you see people different, makes you think different, makes the world look different. Grace, grace is, I mean, listen, when you got saved, God retrofit you to run on grace hall. And there's only one dispenser of grace in the universe, and his name is Jesus. And that's why every single day, before we go out and deal with the gaps in everybody else, we need to sit at his feet and let him fill us up with grace a hall so we can run on the power of God and we can go bless the people that, 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 whose gaps we need to deal with that day. Listen, folks, stay filled with grace. That's what God did with your gaps. Filled them with grace. And commit to intercession. Decide that the way you're going to deal with gaps is you're going to cooperate with God and not cooperate with the devil. That you're going to intercede like Jesus and not accuse like Satan. You say, how in the world can I do that? Well, let me give an illustration. There There was a man one time named Johnny Lingo. And Johnny Lingo lived on the island of Nawabi, and, and, uh, and, and he was the richest young man his age. And the reason that he was so rich is because he was a smart trader, smart trader. Now, he was in love with a girl on a neighboring island of Kinawati, and her name was Sarita. Now, the thing about Sarita is you'd be surprised that she would ever have any kind of interest from a man at all. I mean, I mean, if you'd have, if you'd have been Mister Rogers, you'd have probably said she's kind of, she's kind of homely. If you'd have been Donald Trump, ain't no telling what you would have said about her. She she she, walked, she was tall and she was skinny and scrawny and she walked around with her head down and and her matted hair kind of covered her face. And if you ever did see her face, it wasn't much to look at. And now 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 the people of Kinawati had an interesting marriage custom. The custom was that when a man wanted to marry a girl on the island of Kinawati, he would come to the father of that girl and he would trade cows for her, for her hand in marriage. Now, the average girl on Kinawati had gone for three cows. Now, the village elders had already come to Sarita's dad, whose name was Sam Karad, and had told him he could really only expect about two cows for Sarita, but he'd made up his mind he'd settle for one. Well, Johnny loved Sarita, and everybody knew it. And it came time for him to engage in the custom and bring the cows to trade for Sarita. So when he came over from Narabi to the island of Kinawati, and all the people came out from the villages, it was almost a parade every time this happened, and and when Johnny Lingo brought the cows, they were shocked, they were amazed, they couldn't believe it, but Johnny Lingo brought eight cows to trade for Sarita. They're like, what's the matter with this guy? Has he seen her yet? Is he blind? Doesn't he know she's a one-cow woman? But he brought eight cows to trade for Sarita. And the question comes, why would a smart trader pay eight cows For a girl that he could have had 
for one. Within a few months, people realized that Johnny Lingo got the best deal in all the islands. Because in a few months, Sarita became the most beautiful woman in all the islands. How does that happen? Like this. Let's go forward one. One more. Many things change a person. Things happen inside and things happen outside, but the thing that matters most is what she thinks about herself because the me I see is the me I'll be. In Kenawati, she was treated as a one-cow woman, so that's what she was. In Nawabi, to Johnny Lingo, she was an eight-cow woman, more valuable than any other, and that is what she became. Johnny Lingo loved Sarita and wanted an eight-cow wife, so that is what he paid for and he got. Now listen to me very carefully. Here's why I tell that story, and here's the secret to intercession. Listen, every Christian is an eight-cow saint. So every Christian deserves to be treated like the eight-cow saint they are. Now, let me, let me just bring it home. Even you, some of you got a self-esteem through the floor. I want to tell you something. Even you are an eight-cow Christian in the eyes of God. Let me take it a step further. You are just as valuable to God as any Christian who ever got saved and walked on this planet. How can you say that, Scott? Here's why. Because God paid the same price to get you as he did Billy Graham or the Apostle Paul. If Billy Graham or the Apostle Paul walked in this room tonight, how would you treat him? Every Christian deserves the same because every Christian is an eight-cow saint. Now, that's not what we do. We grade. We, we got four-cow, five-cow, six-cow, three-cow, two-cow, one-cow. And if you see yourself as a three-cow saint, well, then you feel like you have the right and the prerogative and the privilege of treating somebody that's three-cow, two-cow, one-cow one way. And then there are people you think are above you, and they're six-cow, seven-cow, five-cow, and you treat them a different way. And I'm telling you, God comes along with the blood of Jesus and levels all of it. Because, quite frankly, all of us have been paid for by the same price in the same blood. Amen. And so we're all eight-cow Christians, and so here's the great thing. I realized in the Church of the Living God, one of the faults that it has is that it tends to be on a grading system. And so when I moved around the country, moved around the circle of believers, often I felt like I was judged and graded. And so what I found was God wanted me to sit more at the feet of Jesus and get his estimation of me and get his valuation of me and fill me up so much with his love and remind me that I'm an eight-cow Christian so that I could be set free from the appeasement and the approval of man so I could go out into a world of gapped up people and and love them the way Jesus does and care nothing about their opinion of me. Hallelujah. I want you to read the next slide with me as we think about interceding and cooperating with God. Read it out loud. Seeing the potential in a person is an act of faith. I do not want to react to behavior that is negative and thereby reinforce it. I am able to see the best in people. By believing the best about people, I am able to bring out the best in them. Think about what God did for you with your gaps. Unmerited, unearned, undeserved. And now God, filling you with grace, sends you back out into a gapped up world to do the same. We are living in a culture that is choosing as its very foundation accusation daily and Christians a little different. We're only as good in the culture to the degree that we cooperate with God. And God's way is always intercession. Not the devil's way 
of accusation. Can we, in 2020, God help us, be more like Jesus in a world that needs to see people, eight cow saints, who are more like Jesus. Amen. Let's all bow our heads. Father, I confess to you tonight that too often in my life I have cooperated with the enemy. I have let my first thought be my final thought, and it was one of accusation and criticism and negativity. But I think tonight about what you did when you saw the space between what I ought to be and what I was, and you filled it with grace. And you've done that for every person in this room. And I pray tonight that we'd be a people that you could count on to be like Jesus, to stand in the gap interceding so that you will not have to destroy the land. Bucky's going to come and he's going to sing. If you feel so led tonight to join me here at the altar, and maybe your prayer is simply this, I just want to be more like Jesus. I've, I've been an accuser. I want to be an intercessor. I want to stand in the gap. I want that if this nation ever goes over the cliff, that it won't be because I didn't do what I was called to do as a representative and ambassador of heaven here on earth. Would you come and stand or kneel or find some space? I know we've got to be six feet apart, but maybe you just want to plant that tonight and say, Lord Jesus, I want to treat Christians like eight cow saints that they are, and I want to walk in the eight cow saint that I am, and I want to treat people the way Jesus would. I want to I want to bless them, not curse them. I want to build them up, not tear them down. I want to stand in the gap and intercede, not accuse. I want God, not the devil, to get the glory in my life. Would you come tonight? And would you say, may it change what I put on social media? May it make a difference about what I say to people at my workplace? May what goes on in the backroom conversations that we often have where we're tearing people down and criticizing, may we be a people, even in our homes, who build up and speak good and edify others. And trust God with the rest. Father, I pray you'd consecrate this time of invitation. Use it for your glory and our good. And for the good where we're salt and light in this nation and land in which we dwell. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Bucky.